All right, you want to know one of the reasons why I'm most proud to be a Minnesotan? It's certainly not the Vikings, because dating all the way back... Guys, I was in fourth grade in 1998 when the Vikings had Randy Moss, Randall Cunningham, went 15-1. and one. Gary Anderson, the kicker, never missed a field goal the entire year until the NFC title game when we lost to the Falcons. I know, I can't even think about it without... Yeah, it's, it's wounding. A lot of Packer fans are happy about that. Whatever. That's not the point. Here's the point. One of the things that I'm actually most proud of about Minnesota is a pretty dorky thing. It's that a specific movie was filmed in Minnesota that I absolutely love. Maybe you've seen it before. This movie that was filmed in Minnesota is about a guy who is, it's Christmas Eve. He forgot to get a toy for his son and his wife expected him to, and he is desperately searching for this particular toy, and he realizes that his neighbor, who he despises, might just have the key to getting that toy. Let's watch. You started it. Okay, so Arnold was not the best neighbor, was he? No, Arnold was not a good neighbor at all in this clip. That's the movie Jingle All the Way, in case you haven't seen it. I highly recommend it. One of my favorite Christmas movies. But the point is, Arnold was not a good neighbor. He was a very bad neighbor. He was stealing his neighbor's son's Christmas present. He set fire to his neighbor's house, broke his neighbor's window, ruined the neighbor's caroling. So with that, today I'm going to tell you a Bible story about two people who were arguably way worse neighbors than even Arnold Schwarzenegger in that story. But I guess the question we need to figure out and answer is, what does it even mean to be a good neighbor? Because we know that God calls us to be good neighbors. In Leviticus, he says, love your neighbor as yourself. But what does it really mean to love somebody? Does it mean maybe to help them? I mean, that's, I guess, a good start. Because if we can get really good at helping others, especially people in need, then, I don't know, maybe we could help ease their worry, ease their sadness. We can bring them joy. We can bring them relief. Maybe we're talking about somebody who's in need, like a person who is doubting that God cares about them. Maybe it's somebody who is ill or their family member's ill. Maybe it's a, a classmate who has nobody to sit with at the lunch table. Maybe it's as simple as just your mom needing help with the dishes. Maybe it's as simple as your brother needing help with their math homework. Now, in these moments, it's really easy for me anyway to make excuses as to why I don't need to be a good neighbor and help them. Especially if it's somebody who has recently wronged me, and I'm like, <laughs> good, they're getting exactly what they deserve. I'm glad they're in need, and I hope nobody meets their need. But the reason why we do that is because we've got a, a, a misunderstanding of what we're called to do in those situations. And maybe we think in those moments, okay, you know, it's, it's just not convenient for me to help. Maybe I'm, I'm too busy. Uh, maybe we think, I, I just recently helped them. Or maybe we think, uh, you know, They've never done anything nice for me. Maybe we think uh, somebody else would do a much better job helping them, so I'm not going to be a good neighbor to them. What are we missing here? What motivation are we lacking here? Why is it so hard to be a good neighbor all the time, even when it's inconvenient, either to our schedules or to our egos? We need to continue our conversation on the fruit of the Spirit, because this is what's going to help us figure out how to be truly good neighbors. So, quick refresher, the fruit of the Spirit are fruit, a.k.a. character traits that Jesus displayed in his life on earth, that the Holy Spirit, if we know Jesus, the Holy Spirit lives in us, produces these fruit in our lives. They are, Paul says, love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. So we've already talked about love, joy, peace, and patience. Now we've got to talk a little bit about kindness and goodness. How can we display kindness and goodness, and what does this even have to do with being a good neighbor? Today I'm going to give you a very simple definition of what God sees as a good neighbor. I'm also going to give you three habits of good neighbors so that you can be equipped and know how to be a good neighbor the way that God calls you to. So how do we figure out how to be good neighbors? We read in the book of Luke, chapter 10, Jesus is telling a story. But first, he's teaching a crowd, and there's a uh, religious leader there, and he's trying to stump Jesus. And so he says, 
all right, Jesus, how does one inherit eternal, eternal life? And Jesus is like, well, what does the law say? So this is what the guy says. The man answered, you must love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul, all your strength, and all your mind, and love your neighbor as yourself. He's quoting, the religious leader is, he's quoting Deuteronomy in part, and he's also quoting Leviticus. So, in response, Jesus says, that's exactly right. That, that, is, that, that is correct. But who is my neighbor? Is what the, man, the religious leader asks him. He says, Jesus, okay, fine then. Who is my neighbor? And so, Jesus tells the story of the good Samaritan. This is how we figure out what a truly good neighbor is. So there's a Jewish man. He is traveling from Jerusalem to Jericho. This is the story that Jesus tells, the parable of the Good Samaritan. Jewish man traveling from Jerusalem to Jericho. While he's on his way to Jericho, he gets robbed by bandits. They beat the tar out of him. They take his clothes. They leave him for dead on the side of the road. A couple people walk by, and you'd think these people would be the types of people who would help this Jewish guy. One person who walks by is a priest, walks by, sees the Jewish man who's beaten nearly naked on the side of the road, says, I'd rather not, I got to be going. Walks to the other side of the road and ignores the man who's laying there hurting. Then a temple assistant comes by and he kind of does the same maneuver. He's like, sees the Jewish guy hurting, beaten nearly naked, nearly dying, and he's like, I'm I got a, yeah, I got a, I got a meeting. I got a, so he leaves. Both of them pass by the man who's hurting. Then a Samaritan man comes by. Now back then, for Jesus to be telling this parable and explaining this story to them to the Jews, back then the crowd would have known Jews and Samaritans despised each other. They thought differently. They looked differently. They believed differently, and so they felt that they needed to despise each other. But a, a Samaritan man walks by the Jewish man who's laying there hurting. And the Samaritan man has compassion on the Jewish man. The Samaritan man goes to the Jewish man who's hurting. He bandages his wounds. He places the Jewish man on, on his donkey, the Samaritan man's donkey. Rides the, walks the Samaritan man on the donkey, walks him to, uh, along a rugged road. And they get to a hotel in a town. The, Jew, the Samaritan man stays with the Jewish man that night. And the next morning, the uh, Samaritan man has to go. But he leaves the hotel manager with two coins that are worth two days wages. Gives that up and gives it to the hotel manager and says, I need to go, but please take care of this Jewish man who's hurting. And if next time I see you, if, if what you have to do to help this guy costs more than these two coins, these two days wages... I'm going to pay you back in return even more once I come back. I'll pay, I'll pay you what you're due. So think about this, okay? Clearly, this guy, this Samaritan man, was a good neighbor. Clearly, he demonstrated, undeniably, kindness and goodness, which are the fruit that we're trying to hopefully have the Holy Spirit produce in our lives. But a couple more questions need to be answered about this story. Because, okay, what was it? ultimately deep down that was truly motivating the Samaritan man to be kind and good to this Jewish man. I mean, is, is, is all that it is just to be kind and good? Is that the only definition of what it means to be a good neighbor? What else is there? What motivates true good neighbors? Now, maybe a lot of people, and maybe you're in this camp, I think a lot of people define good neighbor in a similar way to the, the way that the driver in this TV ad defines good neighbor. So as you watch this clip, I want you to be listening. How does the driver of the car in this clip define good neighbor? Have you tried one of these? It's so good. Hey, and I can't believe we haven't done this before. Oh, wow, look at that. What a bike. You're aging. Do the jingle. Do the jingle. Like a good neighbor, State Farm is there. Hey, guys. Uh, uh, do it again, do it again. Like a good neighbor, State Farm is there! In my office! State Farm. I think we're good. <laughs> State Farm agents are there when you need them. Okay, so quiz time. Like a good neighbor, State Farm is, number one, literally living next door. 
Two, kind to those who are kind to them. Three, kind to those who are just like them. Four, free when it can, it's convenient for them. Or five, there. Raise up with one through hand, one through five on your hands. What is the correct answer? Looks like a lot of fives. Okay, yes, like a good neighbor, State Farm is there. Maybe you didn't even need to see that commercial to know how State Farm defines a good neighbor. So does this mean that when we are called to be good neighbors, does this mean if we know that we're supposed to be there for people, okay, that's fine and good. Does it mean that we're supposed to be there for people who are living literally right next door and only them? Does it mean that we're only called to be there for people who are kind to us first? Does it mean we're supposed to be there for people who are exactly like us in terms of the way we think, the way we talk, the way we dress, what we believe? Does it mean that we're only called to be there for people when it's convenient for us? I think based on the story of the Good Samaritan, I don't think we can say those things. Because think about the, think about the Samaritan man. Think what he did. He, he didn't help somebody who lived right next door. Jews and Samaritans hated each other, and he had to go out of his way to help him along a rugged road. The Samaritan man, I mean, the Jewish man hadn't been kind at all to the Samaritan man previously that we know of. And Jews and Samaritans had reasons. They didn't have reasons, but it was um, a, a cultural trend for them to hate each other. So it's not like the Jewish man had gone out of his way to be kind to the Samaritan man first. Uh, the Jewish man and the Samaritan man didn't look alike, didn't think alike, didn't believe the same things, but the Samaritan man was still kind. And it was not convenient at all for the Samaritan man. Gave up two days' wages, spent a night in a hotel with him, went out of his way on a rugged road. Now, these are all, again, great things that the Samaritan man did for the Jewish man who was hurting. But we still don't know what ultimately motivated the Samaritan man to do what he did. And in order for us to figure that out, we got to go back to the end of this conversation. It's the conversation that ensues, the follow-up, after Jesus tells the parable of the Good Samaritan. Jesus and the religious leader who is trying to stump Jesus, they have a follow-up conversation. This is how it goes. Jesus says, now which of these three men, the priest, the temple assistant, and the Samaritan, which of these three men would you say was a neighbor to the man who was attacked by bandits? Jesus asked. So the man replied, the one who showed him mercy. Then Jesus said, yes, now go and do the same. Here's God's definition of what it means to be a good neighbor. Neighbors are kind and good out of mercy. Neighbors are kind and good out of mercy. Now, I would feel very emotionally uh, detached from this message if I didn't share with you a time when I desperately needed mercy. So there was, a handful of years ago, there was a guy who... Um, was very vocal on Facebook about his politics. And as we know, social media is the most healthy place to have conversations about politics, right? I mean, clearly. So I was already a little peeved, one, about his political beliefs, two, that he was voicing these things uh, in, in the forum that he was voicing them, and kind of, I perceived, kind of like pooping on people who held my political beliefs, it also drove me nuts that he was voicing these beliefs in the name of Christianity. And we can have debates back and forth about what is the right involvement for Christians in politics. But the way that he was phrasing it, at least to me, I felt that it was isolating people who are truly trying to follow Jesus um, but have different political beliefs from him. Anyway, that was just my own observation, and I know better than anyone. No, I don't. But I felt that I did. I thought I was better than this guy. I thought I was smarter than this guy, and so I decided to teach this guy a lesson. So I got very vocal in this Facebook thread, and I just skewered this guy, and I was ruthless. I'm like typing and I'm so proud of myself and I'm like oh my gosh I can't wait to press enter on this and I pressed enter and I was like yeah and then of course that erupted and made the Facebook thread even more divisive and even more just spiteful and even worse 
A couple days go by, and I just feel the Holy Spirit convicting me like crazy. I'm like, oh, why did I say that? In the heat of the moment, I had written just really mean-spirited things. And then a couple days later, when I'm less mad about it, I'm like, why did I say these things? And in public, and on a thread with a bunch of people who know me, still know me, who knew me. And I'm like, oh, why did I do this? I just humiliated myself, and I was a total jerk. So I'm like, oh, what do I do to make this right? Obviously, I needed to ask God for forgiveness. Then I was like, I need to ask somebody else for forgiveness. So I called the guy, and I apologized to him personally. He was very gracious with me, very forgiving with me. And then I was like, okay, well, I apologized to him in private. That's, like, good enough, right? And I was like, you know what? I skewered this guy in public, in a public forum. I need to make this right in a public forum. And so I was like, I don't want to do this. But I typed out an apology to that guy and to the thread of people who were on it and the other people I was rude to. I typed out an apology and pressed send. And the flood of grace and mercy and forgiveness that I received from people responding to my post was truly incredible. Even if I hadn't received that, I still would have known that that was what I needed to do. But it was incredible to experience mercy, having truly needed mercy and having truly humiliated myself publicly and especially claiming to be a follower of God, being a total jerk in a social sphere with a bunch of people who follow God and people who didn't follow God. I was like, oh man, that guy gave me mercy who had created the post, the people on the thread gave me mercy. And he and I recently went out to lunch together and um, he and I are still in touch and things are, are cool between us. And he is so kind to me and I'm, I'm, um, I'm just so grateful for the mercy that he gave me. But I think that shows what it means to be a good neighbor. That guy was a good neighbor to me. He was kind to me. He was good to me. He saw my need for mercy. Now, it's not always easy to be merciful, especially when people aren't asking for mercy. I did technically ask for mercy from that guy and from the people on that Facebook thread. But what about when people don't ask for mercy? How do we be kind and good then? How do, or what if it has nothing to do with somebody who was, who was a jerk to us? What, what if it's just somebody we, we see their need for mercy? How do we be motivated to be merciful? Here are the three habits of a good neighbor. We'll close on this. Number one, remember your need for mercy. That's the first habit of a good neighbor. Remember your need for mercy. So we all have a desperate need as broken, sinful people. We have a need for mercy. We have a need for forgiveness because of our sins. Jesus saw that need and he met that need by coming and paying the penalty on the cross for our sins so that we could be forgiven if we have a relationship with him. So that can help motivate us to be merciful. Number two habit of good neighbors is they look for neighbors needing mercy. A good neighbor is somebody who shows kindness and, and, and goodness out of mercy. But if you're wondering, well, who is my neighbor? I believe based on the story of the Good Samaritan, I think we can say it's somebody we see who needs mercy. Now, this could be somebody who maybe needs mercy from us personally. So that immediately gives you a quick pool of people where it's like, okay, who do I despise? Who do I hold a grudge against? Who do I disagree with every word that comes out of their mouth? Who, when they open their mouth, it sounds like fingernails on a chalkboard. That might be somebody who is your neighbor. Also, it could be somebody who is in phys- like need of physical mercy. It could be somebody who is on the street and somebody who is, has, has um, a, a need for tangible mercy, like food, shelter, water. How can we show mercy to them? It could be somebody who is in need of kind of more social mercy. Maybe they're they're truly lonely and we see their need for mercy. And how can we bring them mercy in that way? 
Uh, maybe it's someone who is in need of spiritual mercy, just like we all need, but maybe they don't yet see their need for God's mercy and forgiveness and love. How can you help, in a way, facilitate God meeting that need for them? So that's the second key, second habit of a good neighbor. And the third one is give them mercy generously. The Samaritan man did not make any excuses. The guy who he had cultural, at least poor justification for despising, he went out of his way, bandaged him, gave him his donkey to ride on, took him on a rugged road, paid him, uh, the hotel manager, two days wages. He was lavishly generous with mercy. You could argue that was kind of more in the, in the range of physical mercy for this guy, this Jewish guy. So what does it look like for us to meet their need for mercy generously? Maybe it is somebody who has ticked you off for the millionth time and they haven't apologized for it. Maybe it looks like you choosing to forgive them in their heart, even if they have not asked you for forgiveness. Maybe it looks like you going to them and apologizing for whatever part you played in the tiff. Maybe that's what it looks like. Maybe it looks like helping meet physical needs for people. That could mean volunteering at a homeless shelter or doing something where there's some organization that helps facilitate helping people get back on their feet. Maybe it's somebody at, at school who is, you know, doesn't have money in their lunch account. You can help them that way. Maybe it's you see at church the pastor.